Before we get started, Talk Music Talk has a newsletter, a weekly email featuring the current week's guests, plus what past guests are up to. Also, I'll tell you about shows I've attended and new music that I like. To sign up, head on over to TalkMusicTalk.com, click on the link, subscribe to newsletter, and you are all set. That's TalkMusicTalk.com. And now for today's episode. Hello there. Welcome to another episode of Talk Music Talk with Boyce. I am Boyce, your podcasting host. This is episode 129 of Talk Music Talk. It is a weekly music interview podcast where I have long form conversations with people who are connected to music from different genres and different backgrounds, emerging, established singers, songwriters, musicians, music therapists, music journalists. And on episode 129, I had the pleasure of speaking to Hasham Akira Barucha. He is a visual artist, a drummer. You may know him from his solo project, Soft Circle, or his trio that he is in, Kill Alters. Brooklyn-based, this interview took place in his art studio, actually. He was born in Japan to a Japanese mother and a Burmese father. As a kid, he started playing music after getting into heavy metal music especially Metallica. He talks about that. Self-taught on bass and drums. He also had an interest in visual arts because he was exposed to it as a child because his mother worked in visual arts too. So there was always art supplies around the house. He was also into skateboarding, which he talks about. He attended college at RISD for photography. And that's when he really started to take his music seriously, got into noise and experimental music, started making that. Also, he talks about adjusting to American culture. We talk about his meditation practice, what inspires him. And after the conversation, you will hear a track from one of his projects, one of his musical projects, Kill Alters. The song is called The Holder from their album No Self Helps, which came out last year. Incredible drumming on here. Check it out. I've seen Hisham play twice live. He is a breathtaking, incredible drummer. It's amazing to not only hear what he's doing, but to just see his whole body and everything that he puts into a performance. So after the conversation, you will hear a taste of that. You should check out him performing live whenever you get the chance. The Holder from No Self Helps. Here it is. Without further ado, my conversation with Hasham Akira Barucha, episode 129 of Talk Music Talk. Enjoy. As someone who hand is in many different mediums, uh-huh. did you have that mindset naturally? Sometimes people feel like they can only do one thing, or did you always feel like, you know, there's many things I'm attracted to and I can go out and do those things? Right. I mean, my whole thing, growing up, my mom did visual art, and uh, she did, she, she taught like a fo- American folk art painting when we lived in San Diego when I was a kid. So during my elementary school years, I was in San Diego, um, and uh, I feel like, you know, art supplies were around, and I was really into manga, and uh, and so, like, I, I started doing visual stuff. Uh, my dad was really into music, mm-hmm. so so he would... You know, I feel like I listened to everything from, I mean, like I was, uh, you know, born in the late 70s. So like, uh, like I, I feel like I listened to like Japanese pop stuff. Like yeah. my mom is Japanese and my father is Burmese. Um, so, so I would listen to like Japanese, like, you know, Pink Lady was a thing. Like, okay. Yeah, a, yeah. You know, I remember Pink Lady. Yeah. yeah. They so had a that, TV show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they were like a thing. Um, so I loved that as a kid. And then my dad liked the Beatles and a lot of fifties, like mm-hmm. uh, I guess sort of early rock and roll, and um, and so I was always lis- always listening to music, and uh, because of him, and so I feel like I just always was into both, but I didn't start playing music until I got into heavy metal, basically. Okay, you know, so so yeah, like a uh, as a kid, like I, I I didn't really think I don't know if I thought about doing like that. I was just interested in both, so I just yeah. did it. It wasn't like uh, that that I, I made some kind of choice to do both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was uh, when? How'd you get into heavy metal? Um, oh, it was yeah. like total, like uh, like the the best days of MTV. I think. Okay. Like I didn't even have MTV at home. I would 
I would watch it at my friend's house and then Headbangers Ball came around yeah, yeah. and I was like, oh man. <laughs> um, I, I, I would get my friends to video, videotape it for mm-hmm. me and then I would watch it over and over. And uh, and then uh, my brother and I, my, I have an older brother whose name is Hashim and that's sort of why I use my middle name, Akira, because okay. Hashim and Hisham, you just s- switch the A uh-huh. and the I and it's <laughs> super confusing <laughs> and we both sound exactly the same uh-huh. and we look pretty similar. Um, and he makes music too, so it's a it's a it's really confusing. But anyways, um, he like we both got into playing bass because of Cliff Burton from Metallica. Mm-hmm. So it sort of all started with, uh, I mean the 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 obsession was Metallica, um, but but that started for, with watching like the Cliff and Wall uh, video that had all this awesome footage of, or kind of terrible mm-hmm. footage, um, but awesome um, footage of. Cliff Burton, and we were like, we got to play. Yeah. Or he he wanted to play bass, and of course, I was a younger brother, typical younger brother thing. I just wanted to be like him, so I started playing bass too. But uh, then I would, you know, I, while watching those uh, those uh, videotapes of Headbangers Ball, I would, you know, I'd play along to that. Um, learn, you know, like feel like some of the first heavy, like heavy metal songs i learned were like guns and roses paradise city okay. or like sweet child of mine or like skid row mm-hmm. and, you know so i like like metal like metallica and anthrax and and um but then i got but i was also into heavy metal like a so yeah it was funny to have that kind of childhood um yeah growing up playing bass was pretty cool mm-hmm. what was it about heavy metal you liked um i think it was just i mean all i feel like all the music i really got into was from skateboarding Mm -hmm. um skateboarding videos uh it would be like contest videos back then were a thing and uh whatever it was that came on that i i I liked in there i'd figure out what it was and i think one of those was metallica Mm -hmm. um but then we like uh we got really into gbh and the exploited and discharge um so i guess like heavier stuff um but yeah, totally because of skateboarding. Mm-hmm. Like uh, I feel like I'll, I'll, even getting into indie rock way later or something like was totally through skateboarding. Okay. Yeah. And when did you start skateboard skateboarding? I started skating like in elementary school, um, and so I've been like skating for all of my life. Yeah. It feels like um, so I still skate around. Um, luckily, now my studio is like skating distance. Mm-hmm. I, I just like I have to be careful because the skate park is literally a block away okay. or not even a block away. So, well, it was funny when I moved in here, I, uh, I, I, you know, I was a little tired, but I saw the park and it was pretty empty. So I was like, I, I'm going to go over it. Like, and I hadn't gone since I had fractured my wrist at another skate park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it was, uh, but lo and behold, I kept, you know, I like was able to do a few tricks, and then I tried one more, and then fell, and on the same wrist that I had fractured, so I got really worried. Um, but uh, but it was it 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 acts up, but, but yeah, but um, so basically, I don't I don't I try not to do tricks anymore. Uh-huh. I just like skate around. Um, to get from one place to the next. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> since I play drums, it's uh, it's super. I mean, I saw it very obvious. Like, like the the time that I I, I hurt my wrist, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'd band practice like the next day, and I was like, oh god, okay. what did I do? <laughs> um, you know, so um, you don't have your uh, hands in short. Hands, what's that? You don't have your hands and wrist in short. Oh yeah, oh, man. <laughs> get like all Rihanna on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I guess <laughs> maybe I should. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah i, I feel like uh yeah i met like I, I all the the early shows that i went to as a as a as a, as a kid or like early teenager were all metal shows the mm-hmm. first five shows i saw were metallica shows okay at arena shows like the first time i smelled pot was in the parking lot yeah. at, at a metallica show and like such a and I didn't know what it was. I was like, "What is that? Uh-huh. What is that smelly thing?" But I was like, "I don't care." Like I had no earplugs. Like you know, like uh, just ears blown out. The next day, my neck's blown out, and just bragging about how awesome it, the show yeah. was and how sore my neck was. Like uh, um, those are very fond memories. And looking back at my like my brother's best friend at the time's dad, who was nice enough to drive us. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, you know, like with his arms crossed, having to sit through like two hours of metal, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was that dad. Yeah, was, yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> yeah. So he was a good sport. 
Were you going with your uh, skateboarding friends? I was going with my older brother and like his, his friends, like, uh, and then I mean later on, like, uh, like so. I mean, in, in, I was born in Japan, um, in in Niigata, which is uh, northwest Japan, where my mom is from. Mm-hmm. But I immediately moved to uh, Tokyo after that, so my birth certificate says Tokyo. Um, and then we moved around a bunch, like when when I was young, like I think it was a sort of a typical American dream sort of situation. Yeah. But but uh, like so, we my parents wanted to get to America, I think, but first go through Canada because it was they thought it was safer. Yeah. Um, or that's what my mom told me. Um, so we lived in Toronto from when I was two till six, um, and then we moved to Los Angeles um, for a year and a half, and then moved down to San Diego. Um, and then while, while we were in San Diego, my dad got cancer and passed. So my mom, uh, decided that it would be better to go to, uh, or move back to Japan Mm -hmm. to, to make a living. Okay. Um, so that's basically what we did. Um, so that sort of all, all of that sort of, uh, moving around and adjusting culturally to places, um, informed like what i was interested in and Mm -hmm. how and what but i mean um yeah let me uh, like i but i always skateboarded and i was always into music and and always into visual stuff too how old was your father when you when he died uh i was 10 okay yeah and how does that affect you like with the death and then moving around a lot yeah i mean I, i mean at the time i didn't like it of course uh you know uh my dad's death is like the was is still like the i feel like the the reason why i i sort of uh try to max like i'm kind of a maximalist in terms of living and Mm -hmm. and experiencing because of that you know like uh because i know that life is temporary and i know that you know i i feel like it's just a it's just embedded in me Mm -hmm. to to try to experience as much as i can while we're here and then also to as a creator to to make as much uh of everything that i want to um so that's a it's a huge influence on me mm-hmm. yeah yeah and it feels like a natural extension of all the different mediums yeah would extend from that yeah 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 totally. and, uh the metallic years the metallica years and all that was that in san diego that was san diego okay. and then still into tokyo so mm-hmm. like uh yeah like uh Oh yeah, I guess that's where this whole story sort of. Uh, I wanted to lay out the the basics of uh, my uh, my my uh, my physical life journey. But um, but yeah, so I, when I when I moved back to Japan, I just started to go to metal shows with my friends. But yeah, I guess it was skateboarding friends. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, like uh, I I remember get, becoming friends with people or, or like this one. Uh, metal girl who I would see right by my high school. My high school is really pretty far from where i lived um i think like uh, like honestly i don't i like it was a it was a half boarding school and half co- commuting school okay. and my i don't think my mom could afford the the dorm so so like uh, i i commuted and it was an hour and a half um and, and it was in a part of tokyo is a sprawling city and this is like a a place i was in this area like a hajima which is like uh, kind of close to it's close to Tachika, so it's like not not central Tokyo. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but there was a, like a metal chick that I would always see, and I eventually saw her at a metal yeah. show. Um, I would just be like, "Oh, she has maiden shirt on today," or whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then eventually, like a, you know, we sort of became friends, and and like a, she gave me like a some snapshots that she had of like Slayer or yeah. like her hanging out with all these like like Testament or like you know I saw these like metal bands that mm-hmm. I liked. So so that was pretty cool. But for the most part, I would. Uh, I would just go to, um, yeah. I mean, it kind of like my memory. I don't remember who I'd go with because I, I was so focused on the show. I oh, was okay. like a such a such a fan. Like I, but I have like very fond memories of like seeing Pantera or something, and uh, you know, and these like uh, these different like venues that yeah. I used to go to in in Tokyo. And what age when did you start playing bass? Um, that's a good question. I feel like uh, I feel like it was. Uh, around 12 or 13 or mm-hmm. something like that yeah and then yeah i mean i feel like i was like uh, i was really into the idea of playing drums 
I was totally fascinated as a kid. I remember going to see like uh, there was this uh, this saxophonist named Malta, a Japanese uh, mm-hmm. saxophonist, and she, he, my mom was really into him. It was like kind of like smooth, like kind of fusion yeah. vibe. But that was like a concert that I remember my mom taking me to, and uh, and I just like remember staring at the drummer until I figured out how to play drums. Like okay, okay hi hat like this, and then snare like this. So I I would play drums in my head, but I never had drums mm-hmm. like or or you know I mean it was in Tokyo so. Basically, if you like playing music and you want to have a band, you you go to a rental space, uh, like an hourly rental space, okay. kind of like in New York, um, but uh, but it's a little more expensive there. And uh, yeah, like I played in bands like all through high school, but like I played bass because I could play it at home, yeah. you know. And then everything was self taught, so um, like uh, you know, I would just like spend hours, just all of my time, mm-hmm. just playing bass or guitar, and. Uh, and I remember like falling asleep in my uniform, mm-hmm. like with a guitar, <laughs> and then waking up and playing. And it was yeah. just like a, it was the yeah, this funny memories uh-huh. of that. Yeah. Yeah. How were you in school? Uh, I wasn't like, super good academically. I mean, I feel like my dad was more academic. He spoke like a, a bunch of languages, mm-hmm. and um, I feel like we would feel kind of embarrassed because every restaurant when we were kids, like we would go to, he could speak the language, yeah. but that. But then uh, they would try to speak to us, and we could only speak Japanese and mm-hmm. English, so we were like kind of embarrassed about that. And maybe if he was around, I would have like picked some other language up. Um, but when I moved back to Japan, it was really hard to uh, like Japanese high schools only really teach English and 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 so and, and Japanese, of course. So mm-hmm. so uh, I just didn't have I didn't have that uh, like outlet. Like I wasn't going to go to I was like gonna go skateboarding on the weekend i wasn't gonna go Mm -hmm. to like unless my mom forced me which she didn't so um i tried to i remember trying to take language classes at school because we had a lot of uh people who lived in different countries growing up um uh but i had like a a skateboarder friend in high school who was uh, from brazil and um and i wanted to take portuguese Mm -hmm. but it was all for people who already spoke it okay so um but yeah like uh, i i I think it was. I, I'm th- talking about this because when I went moved back to Japan, it was like a. I basically sort of realized how I, I like I had slacked off on my my Japanese Saturday school. Mm-hmm. So like I went to a normal like a American like a you know elementary school, um, but on Saturdays I was like, like went to a Japanese school um, and they teach everything in Japanese. It'd be science, you know, yeah. everything, math, and Japanese and. Uh, you know, I started slacking off because I, you know, like as as a young like teenager, you don't mm-hmm. want to work. You don't want to work on the weekend, and and um, but but luckily, I liked my friends from that school, so it kept me there. Okay. Um, but when I moved back, I realized that I'd I'd messed up, like because uh, I just uh, didn't. I hadn't been t- reading my kanji, mm-hmm. like uh, I hadn't been doing my kanji so seriously, and that's okay. the that's the Chinese characters okay. like that we use in in Japanese. So. So you know, I was like, "Oh crap!" Like, <laughs> well, I can't. I gotta catch up. And they, luckily, like my high school had. I think this is why my mom put me there. Is they had special sort of like classes for people who had lived in a foreign country mm-hmm. before. Um, but uh, but it was hard. Like, and then I I remember in eighth grade. Wait, no, not eighth grade. Uh, I think ninth grade. I broke my leg skating at like a in this bowl and like kind of like the the outer parts of tokyo um and uh and that like set me back because it was a, a complex fracture mm-hmm. and uh it took like six months to heal and okay. i was out of the school for a month and that sent me back so bad mm-hmm. um or, or so far as far back that then it was uh impossible to catch okay. up <laughs> but um i tried it was just that you know when i was trying to you know i remember very specific memories of uh like Chinese history coming up and you know doing Chinese history in Japan it's all in Chinese characters or you know the kanji yeah. it's the same type of characters as in China and um and it was just impossible I, like like I, I remember going to <laughs> like after class to to meet with the teacher cuz I was so worried I would fail yeah. like I was terrified I remember being so stressed out um and you know they were nice enough to like make sure I passed but 
but because I showed effort. But I remember feeling like <laughs> I was going to die if I failed. Is the language as hard as you hear it is to uh, learn Japanese? Yeah. Um, I mean, I grew, up, I, I grew up speaking it, so I, like I'm, I'm sure it's to- very difficult. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's totally different than. I mean, but like the writing, the character, learning the characters. Yeah, that stuff is that just, that stuff is hard. I mean, like I just have weird gaps in my mind of like wh- when, like the things that I did. I could tell, like it's certain like a uh, kanji that are at the same level as mm-hmm. like maybe if you're in uh, elementary school, like but uh, like probably just didn't study those yeah. that week or something, okay. you know so there's a very specific kanji i can't uh-huh. read um but it's yeah it's hard i mean a lot of people that e- i know who even uh are only speak japanese can't really read a newspaper because mm. they're like there's so many specific kanji for like politics or mm-hmm. something um so so yeah i mean my brother's a professional translator so he could do all that stuff and uh, like read anything and translate it, but uh, but I'm I'm not that way. Okay. Have you retained anything? What's that? Have you retained anything? I mean, I could like I could I I could like uh, I could still read and write, and I I work with Japanese clients pretty often, and you know I try to go back pretty often, and um, my parents did a good job of making sure that we spoke both, uh, and I speak you know only Japanese to my mom. Mm-hmm. They she instilled it so. Or they they instilled that so uh, seriously in our minds that we get like uh, grossed out when we try to speak okay. <laughs> English to our mom. Um, and uh, I speak English with my brother, but yeah, yeah. Did you uh, in high school? Did you have any direction of what you were going to do? Wanted to do in high school? Yeah, after you graduated. I mean, after I graduated, I like uh, the funny thing. Like since my mom was making a living teaching art, and she would uh she actually was on a tv show show uh called oshare kobo which is like a it was a, a on nhk which is a, the national tv channel um in japan that every you don't need cable or anything mm-hmm. that, to watch that um and it was just like a crafts show basically so she'd teach this sort of american folk art style toll painting that she had learned in america okay um and sort of like apply it to like oh like recycle this bottle and make it into a flower vase and you could paint these flowers on it so she'd teach that kind of stuff um and uh wait what was the point of my story there direction oh right yeah so i mean like uh and oh yeah so so basically she she like because I was playing in bands and stuff. I played in like three, ba- three like up to five bands. I remember okay. like back in the day. Um, that you know, she was like, "You're not going to make a living from music. Like you should do, at least do visual stuff." Okay. Um, and she's kind of right. If you look at if I look at it now, I mean, <laughs> the kind of music that I'm into playing is not like like super like I'm not into like trying to make super popular music. Mm-hmm. So. Um, but yeah, like, uh, so, so then I, you know, I took, I think that one of the benefits of, you know, losing a parent when you're young or, or is that you sort of like, a, I mean, for me at least, like I, I really valued all the input that my mother would give yeah. me, but I would take it with a grain of salt, you know, like I wouldn't get mad or, you know, mm-hmm. I would just be like, you know, I'll listen to the parts that I felt really yeah. resonated. Um, and that one, I was like, maybe, maybe she's right. Um, so, but also I didn't want to ruin my sort of image of, of music or my, the, the feeling that music gave me because I loved it so mm-hmm. much that I didn't want it to get stuck in the rules of like a music school or okay. something. Not that I even would have been able to go to music mm-hmm. school because I couldn't even, at that, that point, I didn't even know if I could like, uh, read music, um, like I wasn't practicing it that way. I was just, you know, everything was self-taught, everything. Everything I learned was just from listening mm-hmm. and learning how to play it or watching people or okay. something. There is no YouTube, so obviously, like, it was just like, you know, like literally watching like videos of, of people playing or something. Um, but yeah, so, so basically, I started studying to go to like a Japanese uh, visual art school, mm-hmm. um, which entails uh, being a, there's a very rigorous, uh, uh, exam set up for that so um it's it's really hard to get into college in japan mm-hmm. but the second you get in you could slack off to all hell basically okay. like it's a it's a funny setup um but so getting into even a visual arts school is super competitive um so i went to like a after school cram cram school to mm-hmm. to learn 
um, like realistic pencil drawing and two dimensional design class, basically. Um, and I was terrible. I didn't like, uh, I wasn't like taught how to draw that yeah. way. Um, and all the kids had been doing that because, you know, as Asian families do, they make you focus at an early age and then, um, you start doing that to mm-hmm. try to become like a perfect in in that to get into the most prestigious, uh, prestigious uh, school um so so i was going to this cram school trying to learn like this this realistic drawing and stuff and um i just realized that like uh in japanese schools or art schools like if you go into say like graphic design or something you're not really allowed to take classes outside of that major okay um and i didn't i guess i just already had some kind of instinctual um, thought that I wanted to try all kinds of stuff mm-hmm. then, um, and I knew that American schools were more open, so I had like a pretty open minded uh like younger like a uh, english teacher um, and uh I think his name was will fahey um and he was super nice he even took me he like went with me to like see fishbone when we were in high school yeah. together it was like <laughs> good memories but uh super good guy um but he to- told me about i i i told him i didn't want to go to like a west coast art school um i wanted to go to east coast because i hadn't lived there yet um i wanted to check it out um and he told me about parsons and probably sva and you know Mm -hmm. those kinds of schools and then he told me about risd um and i remember coming to new york um and actually like he had he had moved back by then uh when i was uh, looking at schools this is like early 90s 93 um, and I remember showing up on Hudson and 14th and, uh, and, uh, you know, there's like this triangular building. I think it's, in, it's in some like famous, like a nineties movie, but I can't remember what that is, mm-hmm. but, but it looked kind of like that. It was just like, there's no lights on, yeah. on the street. And, um, I was just like a skater kid, like with like a big bag and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, didn't know how to get into the building. Um, and uh, I remember finding a door and opening it and fe- like realizing that I'd walked in like a sex club mm-hmm. in the basement <laughs> of this building. I think it literally just said like sex, like, you know, like yeah. I, had, I figured it out pretty easily. Uh-huh. And then like w- went back out, still terrified, like, you know, found the payphone and he's like, oh, you have to buzz in and okay. then like figured it out. But then I remember going up to the, like his loft, it was like totally super 90s style, like huge loft, like that you could still have back then uh-huh. around there. And he was like, oh, it's midnight. Uh, let's check this out. Like, check this out. And we go to the side of, uh, I forget what hotel is on, uh, is on that street now, but, um, but it's a cobblestone street. And, uh, and, uh, there are all these, uh, transvestite, uh, prostitutes yeah. on that street. That, that was like their spot. Mm-hmm. And so they came out, um, and, uh, and all these cars would pull up and they'd just like get all over mm-hmm. the cars and it was kind of a beautiful thing. Yeah. Had you um, seen anything like that before? I hadn't. Okay. Like I was totally like like at that point like a sheltered Japanese yeah. kid. But it was cool because I got to go to I think it was like CMJ or some kind okay. of music festival. And um I got to see like all these uh all these awesome bands back then. Like Nirvana's like in utero hadn't come out yet, uh-huh. but they were playing. So I got like a uh you know, scalp ticket on the street. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, luckily like, a, like it, it was pretty crazy. I remember like one of the guys or one guy going in right before me, had bought a scalp ticket, but it was a, it was a fake. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you know, he should, the guy was like, see, there's this pattern here. This is not like, this is not legit. And oh, I was yeah. so afraid that that mine was fake. Um, but, uh, luckily mine was real. Um, so I got to see that show. But, uh, but so getting back to art school stuff, like I, like I, I went to Parsons to check it out. Um, like, and all the kids were stylish and looking me up mm-hmm. and down and I was like, this is too much like Tokyo. Okay. Um, and, uh, it was just, yeah. I just you were like in skate clothes. You had that kind of look. Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like, I mean, I, I, I wasn't, I just like, didn't want to feel like it was about being cool. Yeah, yeah. Like it was just, I just wanted to go to art school. Um, and, um, so I went to, I remember taking a bus down to RISD, uh, it was just super beautiful in New England. Like I'd never seen anything like it and it was totally like, you know, dead poet society or something in my mm-hmm. mind, you know, like I think like it was like very 
college town, yeah. like what I had imagined. So, um, yeah, so I really liked it there. Like, and I knew, I heard that you could take classes at Brown. So I was, uh, I, I, I did my like drawing tests and all that stuff and got in. Um, so I went to RISD. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was your focus? Uh, photography. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I originally thought I was going to go into painting cause my mom is a painter, but, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I like doing that stuff, but I, I had this sort of like thing in my head, maybe there's some realist, like a thing where I need, I thought I needed to like learn something technical, mm-hmm. but I also at, at that school, I, the, like you could be in, um, in that major, you didn't need to do that many photo credits. You, so that meant that I could take like a, you know, I took a lot of video classes, mm-hmm. um, and tried some printmaking classes and. So I basically just like set, set it up for what I wanted to try okay. to do. I just wanted to try out as much stuff mm-hmm. as possible. So I guess like that sort of ethos or something mm-hmm. has like sort of um, kept going in my life. Yeah. So what was uh, school like for you there? Being in Providence, that was super fun. Like um, it was, uh, I mean, it was sort of like a dream come true. Mm-hmm. Like, um, Like it's just like all the weirdos from every part of everywhere like meeting at yeah. at a school you know so you know um of course like eventually you realize it's the same as anything this clicks and all this kind mm-hmm. of thing but like uh but you know i wanted to m- make music at the same time and uh i was already i had already gotten into experimental music in high school um sort of through boredoms basically um so i discovered them like kind of like mid high school mm-hmm. um and uh yeah, like a, I was, I was literally like wearing a, like a, I don't know, maybe I was wearing like a butthole surfer shirt or something, and uh, like uh, some of the, like the, the, the weirder guys there were like, oh, you like, you like butthole mm-hmm. surfers, and like, oh, actually, it's probably a boredom shirt, but like a, you know, if you like that, like come to this, like a thing, and it was, it was like a flyer, handmade flyer for this thing called marching band. And it said like meet at like a like a this brown campus is so and so at midnight. So you know it sounded interesting. Yeah. So I went and like uh, you know all these people show up in like yellow and brown costumes, or yellow and red or something, mm-hmm. with these bulbous like masks that they had made, and um, they're just playing drums. And that was like my introduction to like weirdo Providence like music. And I was like, oh oh shit, this is like <laughs> this is uh this is cool. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I start, I feel like I started playing in bands like, um, like, yeah, freshman year. Mm-hmm. Um, I met, uh, so the, the people that gave me the flyer, it was probably either Matt Brinkman or Brian Chippendale. Um, Brian Chippendale plays in, uh, lightning bolt and Matt Brinkman is a pretty incredible, uh, comic book artist but just artists in general and he was also he he had the his finger on the pulse in terms of like the the best music or weirdest music mm-hmm. or um he would just always found like the most fascinating stuff and it was like he was a very influential guy and i feel like i was able to if i found out about something i could like tell him about it and be like oh, oh yeah that's that's some shit so um so uh yeah like a like a I, I jammed with like one of my first like jams with musicians there was Brian Gibson um, from Lightning Bolt playing drums and then this guy Christy Caracas who's a amazing animator now um, and uh, I can't remember who else was there but we just j- jammed in the basement of the the refectory the the cafeteria mm-hmm. at, at RISD and um, and I was doing like noise vocals then like a I had like all these effects and I'd just do like weird vocals, yeah. which is totally influenced by I from Boredoms and, um, and some other sort of like, uh, bands that did like, you know, effects on vocals. Um, and, um, Christy, I remember Christy saying, you should play with lightning bolts like Brian and Brian and another guy named Brian. And so that just sort of led me to like, just go jam with them. Mm-hmm. And then I eventually joined that band um, doing noise vocals and like extra percussion and stuff. And that was like the, the first band that I joined in, in Providence. Um, and it was the best cause it was, a the band was so tribal and, and like we could play a house house party and people, 
every every type of person would start mm-hmm. dancing immediately. Okay. So it was uh it was just like a, a hit from the very beginning, which is kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, that was I got kinda got spoiled by like starting to play in that band at school. But it was super fun. Yeah. So experimental music, was that something that you liked right away? Did you have to yeah, I mean, learn I, it? I mean to like it. I mean I don't I don't because I grew up in Japan, I was just exposed to it in a like I, I definitely got I so like the story is like I went to see Helmet play because I was still in my metal phase, mm-hmm. um, but they were the first metal band that I saw or you know what, what I thought was metal. Still, um, like the 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 first band was Short Hair that I saw, and okay. that would tune their own instruments on stage. Mm-hmm. You know, like um, <laughs> it was like that level. Like I was still like, wait, what? They're, that's the band. Yeah. I thought those are the, the the tech guys yeah, or something. Yeah. But like at that show, um, there is a a hardcore band that opened called Concrete Octopus, and um, I from Boredoms was in that band, and um, and so he comes out of the audience just like screaming with like a knit hat over his whole face, and you know he's just like yelling concrete mm-hmm. like over and over as he like gets to the stage, and then they play these like. Uh, you know, like seven second songs. Um, and in Japanese uh, hardcore bands, they announce the song, they mm-hmm. announce the band name, they announce the song, they play it, and then they keep doing that. Okay. That's like a, uh, or they keep announcing the song, and that's like a, a Japanese hardcore style. And um, and it, I was just like immediately fascinated. I was like, this, this is this is better. Yeah, I want I want to know more about this. And then another one of my friends was like, well, he's in this other band called boredoms. And then we just all got obsessed with boredoms. Mm-hmm. Um, like it, I did all the artwork and it was like so psychedelic and cool. Um, and uh, like you have to keep in mind, I'm in Tokyo, so I don't even know what, like, I don't know what drugs are. Yeah, like I had yeah. no idea. Like I, I didn't smoke weed until like I was in my, 20s mm-hmm. like i didn't know about drugs i didn't even it didn't even cross my mind they're hard to come by or yeah and you're just not exposed to it mm-hmm. unless you're like a bad kid okay. I, wasn't, I was just like you know i mean in high school i was like a straight edge kid so mm-hmm. i definitely wasn't looking for it um but like um but yeah so like i yeah like uh but basically like i got into experimental music through that and then i got into this band ruins um and that's why when i heard that like Brian and Brian were doing this like a, uh, you know, bass and drum thing. I was like, Oh, it's like ruins. Um, but then, and, and with all these Japanese sort of like crossover, like, uh, you know, still kind of rock, but like experimental E bands, like mm-hmm. they, they always had this sort of like non, non lyrical, like vocal style. Okay. And so I just took that on. Um, it's, it wouldn't be like, it wouldn't be lyrics. It'd just be like sounds. Um, and that was like a huge, yeah, that was like, those are good times and th- like going to so if i then i started to go on going to smaller club shows then that's how i started to hear about all these different mm-hmm. bands and and more noise music and and so i had already gotten into noise music at the end of school like i just like i just liked it yeah i would yeah. just go to like hmv or tower records or something in tokyo and just like if i the Japanese record stores are really good about writing descriptions mm-hmm. so i just read a description and i'd buy okay it, based on know. that yeah so um yeah like I, that's just sort of how i got into it i didn't really have any problem with mm-hmm. is there like it's you have a little, a little more freedom and openness less rules than say metal yeah metal. yeah yeah i mean definitely like it wasn't about like um it wasn't about like riffs um and just like making like killer sort of like hooks or something mm-hmm. like that like it, like it, it was uh it was just more free but it was very high energy still like that's why I got into noise music. I think it was just uh I just felt like a connection to or maybe I felt like I had to like express something like similar, like mm-hmm. something primal. Okay. Um yeah. Were you feeling that on the inside? I mean I must have been. I feel like I was kind of like a depressive like kid in, in college. I mean I definitely was in, in high school, but then I remember or 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 at the end of junior high it was sort of like what you know, cultural things that I was dealing with by moving back to Japan, like, uh, you know, why, why are, well, why are we alive? And then why, why, like, what are all these cultural differences? And like, what, like the, I don't like these parts about Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, but I, 
So, but then I met people who had lived in both places and they're like, you know, you don't have to like be like that. You could just like accept, you could still be yourself and just like express yourself like uh, how you feel you need to. But then there are all these beautiful things about Japanese mm-hmm. culture too. So then I was able to uh, accept all that stuff. I remember like when I moved back to the States, there was a, it was pretty hard to adjust to how vocal everybody was. Yeah. Um, I remember being, you know, I have like a specific memory of like some art history class or some kind of like, you know, starting to get in theory or something. And, you know, like the kids who, who are really outspoken, I remember like some like goth chick was like, you know, like, well, I think this, and I yeah. remember being like so intimidated, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I got kind of quiet when I moved to the States. Um, because I was just afraid of being like ridiculed mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I How'd don't you know. get out of that? Um, uh, I think I just like started to get used to the like challenging, mm-hmm. challenging the space, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, even think like, sim- like simple things like getting a hug from like a girl that wasn't your girlfriend. Yeah. Like that was not Japanese people did not hug back then. Okay. Uh, like it was not, that was not normal. Like we still like bow and then like now people shake, shake hands and some people hug and stuff mm-hmm. now, but it was back then it was like way more old school. Okay. Yeah. So is it more like you feel people's and in- affection and love for you as opposed to an outward showing of it's it. It's supposed to be like a like a like you there there's a saying called like read the air. Okay. Like Japanese people are supposed to be able to like you you don't like spell it out. Mm-hmm. You just are supposed to be able to know. Okay. Which it can be really annoying sometimes. Yeah. And then sometimes it seems more annoying to have to talk about it. It like a uh-huh. you know like in like a like having like a romantic relationships in the states it was definitely like a super learning huge mm-hmm. learning curve because you know i'd be like why do i have to tell you i love you all the time it's like yeah. why? <laughs> don't you know that like don't you trust that like yeah, come yeah. On now you know that kind of thing Can't but you then, feel it in the air <laughs> yeah yeah totally it's just cultural stuff it's like yeah um yeah, and there's still a lot of that like japanese language is pretty uh there there's a vagueness um that happens like if somebody doesn't want to do something that you're 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 you bring up if you're like oh you want to go to the rest this restaurant they'll be like maybe not like they'll say like maybe something else like they'll never say no okay you know? um <laughs> so it's or, very passive aggressive yeah right? uh, yeah it's like it's not aggressive but uh-huh. it's just like it's passive yeah okay yeah it's like um trying to think of like yeah it's like with work stuff like you know if if it's you know like now i do a lot of commission work and like um you know if you if you do yeah if you're in a workspace or something um like it, even in emails like uh like if if you send a bunch of sketches and uh and you're like which one do you like the most mm-hmm. like maybe not this one okay like, <laughs> you mean like you don't like this one yeah you know so it's just like it's a funny thing yeah <laughs> um but yeah there's like these uh, yeah there's a yeah i feel like my communication skills are pretty bad back in my 20s yeah. anyway so. yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> so what is uh how are you making a living like after you go to school like what's your first like break my first break i mean it was cool i mean i was really i thought it was so cool to like uh i was playing in black dice back then at the end of school um we did like a u.s tour um totally diy styles van like you know no cell phones like getting calling card numbers from Mm -hmm. like bands on tour and like making it work um uh and then and then like came like actually like right in this neighborhood like on on my first uh like quote unquote loft um like uh that we moved into was on manhattan avenue so it's just like one over like right by meeker which is where Mm -hmm. we are right now um and uh and yeah like uh we were just uh you know like playing in this band and 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 starting to meet people in new york and like i feel like it was just like being around like being sort of like starting to get known as like the new experimental rock group or something in in new york like starting to meet like a you know um like 
or we we were playing a bunch at the cooler that was on the on the on the in the West Village, or wait, well, uh, Meatpacking District, and uh, like we just meet like like other musicians there, and then uh, yeah, it, it's just like organic New York style. Mm-hmm. Like it would be, you know, the cool thing about New York is like, or at least yeah, I mean, I feel like it's still this way. Is that, I remember meeting like people who made clothes or. Or like, or made visual art, and we all just like hung out because we got like everybody was like inspired by yeah. each other, and like I remember doing like a being in a group show that Brian DeGraw from Gang Gang Dance um, curated at I think it was called American Fine Arts, um, and that was like my first like proper group show maybe mm-hmm. um, that was on Wooster. Um, but I remember doing like a, a mural piece, like a installation, like mural piece. Um, and that was sort of like the start of like starting to show visual work. Um, that wasn't photography. Okay. Um, Cause like I stopped doing photography, like more serious, like, like, a, well, I still of course take pictures now. Um, but back then, like um, it was all film still, there's no digital cameras mm-hmm. yet. So it was, uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't afford film or processing yeah yeah um so and i wanted to you know like uh, eventually you figure out how to navigate cities like you you know you work as an assistant and then you get a connection to a lab and they Mm -hmm. hook you up when you're when you're when the big photographer that you're working or like you know like somewhat big photographer that you're working for has a processing they'll process it for free you figure out these like tricks um but yeah but 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 I started making collage stuff and doing more drawing stuff like after, like because I couldn't afford to do photography. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then so that's like so that's like basically like how I started to do these other things. And it was also connected to band stuff. It was like trying to make artwork for like merch and mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I don't know. I mean, but I remember like a so like maybe fast forward a few years like when like like black dice went through like a like kind of like a transformation era when we were we were doing like more hard like kind of straight hardcore punk but then we got more into we were just trying to push boundaries and we got more into playing like these noise jams that we did like at the end of our like seven minute hardcore punk set, mm-hmm. you know <laughs> um and uh and so so after like people started to realize that the band was like that like you know we were up it was like a physical it was not an altercation but the band got in the audience and like tried to try to make you slightly uncomfortable okay. that was our thing but then people started to realize that that's what we did so then we changed it up by making volume be the the more uh abrasive thing. okay and um but uh we got asked by uh this uh painter richard phillips um to play at his opening that was maybe it was 2000 i think it was 2001 um and uh that was like a huge deal it was like a proper gallery friedrich petzl gallery back then and you know we played like one of the loudest shows we had played um but we had sort of really segued into more textural things Mm -hmm. like mixed with like this sort of like noise like a, a really abrasive noise and and kim gordon and uh thurston moore were there and uh you know they were like you guys sound like white house and mm-hmm. we and we were like that's awesome that's yeah a, yeah that that's cool that you know that 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 band and eventually like those guys like uh you know like became our fans and uh and they invited us out to uh play uh all tomorrow's parties like after this album uh, beaches and canyons came out i think it had already come out um yeah, but like so that that Frieder Petzl like a uh, show was like a uh, was definitely definitely felt pivotal. I remember we painted or we played in front of this painting that uh, Richard had made of uh, of, of George Bush, mm-hmm. like um, and uh, and the day after it was the day before nine eleven. Oh, really? Okay. Um, and so I think that actually like made it so our music changed because uh, because we we just. Uh, like it was kind of organic but i felt like we 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 got away from just playing like straight abrasive things because mm-hmm. we didn't feel like it was needed like there was something like way more severe going yeah, on yeah. that we were that was that we all experienced like living in new york so yeah i mean and then yeah sort of just like kept going from mm-hmm. there 
And how do you keep the balance between the all the visual stuff you do and the music mm-hmm. and soft circle, which uh-huh. is not experimental noise? Uh-huh. Really? Yeah, I mean, like, so yeah, there's all these sort of different phases I feel like I've gone through, um, like musically um, and sort of visually. So now, well, I feel like like uh, through my 30s, it just like uh, I I realized that uh, I needed to concentrate on how to make a living. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, like, so I, I guess I'll just, like, go back and forth a little bit, like, in terms of, like, my uh, my brief history. But, but um, like, after, like, so played in Black Dice till 2004, um, then left the band, and then I started doing Soft Circle because uh, I needed to do my own music. I felt like I, you know, put a lot of work into Black Dice, but then um, needed to figure out, like, a new new way to express what I was mm-hmm. doing. And then I was going through sort of a lot of like my own sort of mental issues. Um, and not, and, and so like basically like sort of gravitated back towards like meditation and spirituality and that kind of thing. And so that's like how like the first soft circle record was more sort of like drone, drone based and sort of like these longer soundscape mm-hmm. things. Um, and so that's what I needed. Like, for for myself back then and i just did it and i didn't want to have to deal with other band members and so it was like a solo solo thing but then i got, eventually just got tired of touring like that it was just a drag like it'd be like touring by yourself yeah, yeah it was just like nobody to relate like nobody to have a mm-hmm. conversation with like other bands that you'd be on tour with they'd be like we're gonna go eat food and yeah then they'd bail because i was just like waiting to do my sound check or something and okay then I'd be by myself and that would happen you know overseas and then the more ambitious I got, the more equipment I had. Mm-hmm. I still had to carry it all by myself. And, you know, I remember like a one uh, time I'd played in London and, uh, you know, I, I had all this gear. The people who had booked the show, like, uh, said that the train was easy, but it was like mm-hmm. way more complicated than I thought. And I didn't, there were no smartphones yet. So I didn't know how to sort of like navigate. Yeah. And I remember just like a taking, like a being so hot from carrying all this equipment. And I took my coat off, and my I was like steaming because um, <laughs> it was so cold out. But yeah. I was, I'd sweat like I'd like run a marathon. Uh-huh. And I was like, "Fuck this!" You know, yeah. it sucks. Um, but I had like multiple things like that, like over the. But I still kept playing like that. I remember doing South by Southwest like solo, and then having friends have to watch my equipment and like having to get driven around because I didn't have a car and. Mm-hmm. Then, like some stuff getting stolen because I couldn't like, you know, it's just one person, like you yeah. put one thing in one place. You can't, you know, unless you like have somebody watching it. And that, that was like kind of like another one of the last straws. Um, but yeah, I've had multiple ones. Um, yeah. I remember also like this one show, another show in London, like uh, Boredom's had played and I uh, tacked on like a soft circle show um, at auto bar Wait, no, not Auto Bar. That's a place in Baltimore. Um, Cafe Auto. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, like, like Chupa Motto was playing, and I sort of befriended them mm-hmm. um, through the internet, I think, at that point. Um, and, you know, they, they said, yeah, like, uh, you, you want to open this show. So yeah. I, I was like, oh, this is amazing. Like, this is like band that I grew up liking. Like, I get to open for them. And then, like, had, like, this, I had visuals, like, created and, uh, like a, it was an all electronic set, and like the, the there was a power surge in one of the um, outlets, and it yeah. blew out all of my equipment. Like blew out two transformers, which uh-huh. was crazy. And then the you know the engineer is freaking out, I'm freaking out, um, and uh, yeah, I couldn't play. Literally, like all my gear like yeah. died. So um, so I like had the jam like with like two. They were nice enough to uh-huh. like, ask me if I'd like play percussion. Okay. You know? so I was like cool, but totally <laughs> not at the same time. You know. Yeah. Um, and I think I just like lost steam, like, uh, and then I was also like trying to learn like, uh, like computer stuff, like to be able to record and make different, you know, different style things. Like I just like didn't take it, but it was harder for me to learn. I just mm-hmm. didn't have the, the concentration or the, the sort of like, n- like a, I didn't have the kind of mind to like read through a bunch of things yeah. and then like, it wasn't not physical anymore. And I feel like I started to make work about that like uh, 
about how music um, is such a visceral experience, but then it became like so sort of like a like not immediate, like in mm-hmm. terms of how you make it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess that's sort of like a long winded sort of like description of like a little bit of like the progressions. But uh, but uh, I mean, I balance it out just by virtue of like what needs to be done. Like I don't I don't get too caught up in. Um, well, I can't because there's so many little things that I need to need to do. Like, you know, it's like, uh, you know, if, if I have like, like, like at the beginning of this year, for example, I had Mm -hmm. a bunch of like commission work that would, that, that I, you know, that pays the bills. So I just like concentrate on that. And then like, uh, you know, right now I have a band called kill altars with my friends, Bonnie and Nikos and they're, and it's super awesome. I'm super into it. Um, and uh like because it's three people there's always something somebody's doing something or you know they'll be working on something and i get the song then i could work on it like by myself and then you know commission work comes in i work on that i get that done like go back to just like practicing drums or something mm-hmm. then i have like you know art stu- i needed to move my art studio so move move that and then i'm thinking about like new ideas to work in here um and how that can in like uh, influence my you know commission work and i'm constantly just like trying to like learn have have like a a new i'm really into pro like ex- the the I, I love the experience of process of, of when you get that when you start to get to a point of uh of growth like when you're when you're creating something mm-hmm. um and that's sort of like a like a reason why i i like trying all these different mediums because i don't want to be I don't want to be just like a, you know, master of none style. I want to like, I definitely want to master yeah. it to a cer- certain degree. I don't need to be like the best mm-hmm. at that, that thing. Like, um, but I want to know it. So it, it's prof- at a professional level. Um, and I like knowing how to like converse in that language. Like say it's like, you know, what it, like it, like I feel like I've produced so many big large scale music events. Like I know the, I know the drill, yeah. you know, I know, we need to figure out a sponsor if there's not like somebody that came to us to, mm-hmm. for a, or came to me or whoever that I work with um, for like an idea. Um, you know, I know the workflow, you know, um, you know, and, and I like being able to speak the talk to talk. Okay. So the same with like, you know, if I like I'm trying to learn some like computer like programs for like, a, you know, moving image stuff and I want to get to the point where I can like speak mm-hmm. the language because it's because right now i'm like wait how do you do this like thing that looks like this yeah and, yeah um or the same with like computer sound stuff i get like a you know i don't i don't know that much so i don't know what the lingo is or mm-hmm. you know or like modular synthesizers which i've tried to like delve into but like i just didn't i wasn't i was sort of like fighting it fighting the urge off to get into it because yeah. everybody was doing it and then i was like it is pretty cool. I'm gonna, uh-huh. I, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in a little bit and dip my feet, but then you can't, you, yeah, you can't just sort of dip your feet to mm-hmm. understand that stuff. So, um, yeah, like so, there's a lot of things to learn. So I just basically like go with the flow. Mm-hmm. If, if I have a chunk of time, like to to like read about something or you know try things out, like whether it's in the music studio or here in the art visual art studio then i just go and do that and it, it's just like super organic mm-hmm. my, my wife always actually like asks me like what i'm going to do the next day and i usually don't know yeah you know see what happens yeah unless like i really have like a you know like a specific thing to do um then then it's it's super organic mm-hmm. and how did you mention uh, meditation and spirituality that's mm-hmm. playing a part in your life and yeah I mean, balance and yeah i mean i feel like art. i'm not yeah i feel like it's not like i don't even like think about it as spirituality really mm-hmm. even anymore like because it's basically like it's like a it's a mental maintenance like the kind of the meditation i do is called vipassana mm-hmm. or some people pronounce it vipassana but like um but it's uh, it's supposed to be the 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 original um meditation teachings of gautama siddhartha like when when it was uh, before Buddhism, okay. so so it's just like a it's 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 basically just like a breathing and body scanning, mm-hmm. um, 
which means like you're just like paying attention to the sensations in your body. And then like when your mind goes to a thought, you're just going back to your breath or that process. Mm -hmm. But through that, you just learn so much if you're somebody who's really interested in being in tune with yourself mm -hmm. as well as being in tune with like a, like once you start to understand how, how your emotions or how your reactions affect your body or how they affect your mind or your mood or anything like that, like, it just it's fascinating you start yeah. to just realize then you're like oh that's why that person's like this or like um yeah or like oh i shouldn't have dealt, deal with that uh, like dealt with that situation this way mm -hmm. you just learn so much just by sitting there and paying attention okay. to stuff because all these all your memories and your sensations sort of like float to the surface um and that's the only way that you can um truly start to understand them like if you don't if you keep keep layering stuff on top of mm -hmm. like it's like a you know like a like a these apartments that are like painted a million times yeah, and you like yeah. wonder how, what's under the layers uh -huh. it's like something like that um and it yeah i mean like sometimes I, i'm a pretty anxious person um and it and meditation is the only thing that can really get me out of that mm -hmm. like a uh, that that zone like sometimes i'll get to the point where i can't sleep and it's a very specific physical sensation mm -hmm. um And, uh, yeah, it's, it's really uncomfortable. So like I immediately just sit and ha I have a sit and like, once I start observing like what's going on, like, um, it goes away mm -hmm. and, um, it's the only thing that's w really worked. Okay. Like, you know, I did, I've definitely done therapy and that helped too. But like, um, but like, uh, meditation is just something that is, it's just a tool. I don't, I feel like I'm, I'm not, I'm not imagining anything. I'm, I'm just seeing what i'm seeing okay you know but i do get a lot of sort of like visual cues from it like because i think when those layers are being um taken apart in my mind um like these sort of like glitches of visuals will, mm -hmm. will show up like um in my mind and that's sort of like a lot of where like my work comes from okay and it'll be like sometimes it'll be sounds that are just like You know, maybe it, it might have been like some sound that I just heard like a few days ago or a song that might like lead to a thought that might lead to this in a matter of like, you know, less than a second. Mm -hmm. But then the the way those sort of transition into each other yeah. for me is just uh, super fascinating. And so, like, I feel like all my work is about that, mm -hmm. you know, just like how strange the, the mind's like wiring is. And then you think about how every single human has a. A, a different way of experiencing or like a, even like a slightly different cultural background or, um, or, or a totally different cultural background. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I mean that all that stuff like is, is, is super influential on, on like me. And that's what I, I, I love about being alive is just, you know, that's definitely one of the better parts about living in New York is you just have all these different cultures mm -hmm. around you and you get to interact and you're trying to, get along and you're trying to like live in the same place. And I mean, after like Trump getting elected, I think it got even more positive in some ways because everybody's really trying to look out for each other. Like, um, especially if you're like a minority or like a, you know, immigrant or, or even like the people who feel like, you know, they're embarrassed that they're, you know, like, like, like they feel like, like a, you know, sort of upper class white mm -hmm. culture or like, or like, you know but the you know I, i guess yeah i guess i'm talking about like the people surrounding like trump um but uh yeah like the like those people might like don't want to be don't want to affiliate so they'll they'll try to be even more understanding yeah yeah um so yeah i mean like uh there's a lot of beauty um like to be seen when when challenges sort of come up so i think all that stuff uh, inspires me Yeah, I like that, dude. So, what else you got? Any uh, things you're looking forward to for the year? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, Kill Alters is about to go play Moogfest, so we're really excited about mm -hmm. that. Um, we're working on a new EP, and we've just been working with uh, these uh, drum sensors uh, created by Sensory Percussion, um, and we're trying to figure out how to incorporate that technology, and it's just, like, really fascinating mm -hmm. stuff. I uh, still haven't gotten a grasp on that. So we're just like trying to really work on figuring that, that out. And then the new music, um, 
then like a I'm supposed to have a, a, a two person show with a, a artist friend. Um, he goes by Yoshi Rotten, um, but he's a Japanese artist uh, and designer. Um, but we're supposed to have a, a, a show in the States this year. Um, I don't, I don't remember what the exact location is going to be because mm-hmm. it was sort of up in the air for a while, but hopefully that that's supposed to happen this year. And then like, I, I feel like I'm just like really want to get, get cracking in the studio as you can see it's still like in the works for setting up to make things so i just want to get it set yeah, up yeah. so i could just like get cracking on that like it's like a lot of i really want to just be in production mode um try to not get too distracted by the summer mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> even though it's impossible because it's like the best time in new york um to because it's yeah you could just be outside and enjoy it but uh, try to try to stay stay focused um, and try to learn some computer programs and be able to make different things and try to yeah just see what happens. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. And best place for people to keep up with what you're doing online. Um, right now, uh, I mean, my, my I have an agency called Hugo and Marie um, that that represents me. Um, and so, if you go to Hugo and Marie, um, you could look up my name um, and and you could see my work there. They're helping me make my new website, so mm-hmm. which will will be up, I believe, in May. So if that happens, then if you look up com, I think that's what it's going to be. So um, and then for Kill Alters, you, you could just go to Bandcamp and just look up Kill Alters. It's A L T E R S instead of A R S. Um, so uh, so you could look us up there. Those are, I guess, those are the main spots. You could look on SoundCloud mm-hmm. for a Soft Circle, and I'm there. Okay. Um, and your Instagram is pretty cool. Yeah, I definitely like taking pictures and posting stuff there. So yeah, if you go to at Soft Circle, that's my Instagram, and Twitter is uh, at Hisham Barucha, and it's a silent H after the B, so B H A R O O C H A, which um, you schooled me on <laughs> before we started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. But yeah, and I will put all that in the show notes. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, thanks for thanks I for asking me. It. It. Yeah. Sure, sure. Super fun.
And that was music from Kill Alters, Hasham's group that was called The Holder. Also in Kill Alters are Bonnie Baxter and Nikos Kennedy. In the show notes, I will put the links to his music and his art because you should check out everything that he does. I am online several places, talkmusictalk.com, for more podcast information. I have a personal website, which is thisisboys.com. You can check out the novels that I write and the music that I make. And if you are on Instagram, follow me there at thisisboys. Call to action for you. Download the Talk Music Talk app. It is free for iPhone and Android, and you get every single episode of the podcast wherever you get your apps at. Or you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and many more places. And if you are listening on iTunes, please leave a rating and or review to help spread the word about TMT. You can also find the podcast on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash forward slash this is boys starting with episode 100. And you can also check out my music there, soundcloud.com forward slash this is boys. And once you sign up for the podcasting subscription, all free, I have a call to action for you. Another one. Well, this is a back catalog suggestion. Check out episode number 71 with Profine. Sharma, that's from March 2016, electronica producer and artist. Duo project of his is Sepulchre, and then he has a solo project, which is called Braille. Talks about all of that. You will get to hear music from him on it. Episode number 71 with Praveen Sharma. Compliments this episode quite well. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time, and there will be a next time. This one's for you, Liz. Liz.